still sometimes. Uh, okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Saul Price Lecture at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. The Saul Price is an international award established under the auspices of Sir Wen Wen Shaw to honor individuals for achieving distinguished breakthroughs in academic and scientific research or applications. The award is dedicated to furthering societal progress, enhancing quality of life, and enriching humanity's spiritual civilization. The Saul Prize makes three annual awards in three areas, astronomy, life science and medicine, and mathematical science. Each prize carries a monetary award of one million US dollar. Today, we are honored to have Professor Xiaodong Wang, the 2006 Saul Prize Laureate in the area of life science and medicine to speak to us. May I first invite Professor Paul Chu, President of Hong Kong University of Science and Technology to say a few words of welcome. Good morning. Welcome all to HKUST. That's a tradition in China. Whenever you do something like that, you have to lit up some firecrackers or even light up some cannons and make big sounds. But this morning, God helped us with all this <laughs> lightning. So anyway, Professor Wang, Professor Yang, Sir Michael, Atias, and Dr. Li Kaifu, and also Professor Manford, uh, Council Chairman, Dr. Zhang Qian, and um, um, I always call her Dr. Uh, Sarah Liao, who is the, in charge of the environmental and transportation in Hong Kong. We're very glad that you are here today. And uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as president of HKUST, I welcome Professor Wang as the newest Shaw Laureate for Life, Science, and Medicine. Professor Wang's life is an in inspiration for us all. As an educator, I cannot resist to use his success to send a strong moral message to our young students, uh, some of whom give up too early and too easily on life and its challenges. Born in a humble family, Professor Wang grew up in the care of his grandmother, but he turned his poverty into purpose, his hardship into horsepower. After graduating from Beijing Novel normal university. He went to the U.S. Obtained, obtaining his Ph.D. in biochemistry from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in 1991. In 2004, he was elected as a member of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States and is one of the Academy's youngest members. In addition, he was the first one from the mainland uh, uh, recently got elected to the United States uh, National Academy. Professor Wang likes to consider himself an ordinary man, but his achievements are extraordinary. He's a young man in a hurry. Since getting his PhD in 1991, he has been going at a, a breakneck speed, clocking up one achievement award after another, year after year, sometimes with multiple awards in the same year. He published more than 50 research articles between 1993 and 2004 and registered nine patents under his name as of mid-2003. Among his many awards are the National Academy of Sciences Award in Molecular Biology in 2004, the Outstanding Achievement Award from American Association of Cancer Research also in 2004, and the Eli Lilly Award from the American Chemical Society in 2000. Qu quantitatively, Professor Wang is a runaway winner, but in this case, quantity takes a back, back seat to quality, for his pioneering research into cell death has far-reaching implications for understanding human disease and their treatment for cure, especially in cancer. I will let Professor Wang explain to you the essence of his scientific research, but this much I know, 
what he is doing is vitally important to us all. He is already pointing a revo revolutionary way to the treatment of cancer. By decoding the death of cells, Professor Wang may soon unlock the secrets to a long and healthy life for all mankind, controlling the inevitability. And what can be more important than that in life? Ladies and gentlemen, let us give a rousing welcome to Professor Wang, a giant in medical science and hero in life. <clears throat> Professor Sheldon Wang will now deliver the Shaw Prize Lecture. His title is How Do We Save Life by Understanding Death? Professor Wang, please. Thank you, Paul, for that way, way too generous introduction. Uh, for a moment, I was thinking, who you are you talking about? <laughs> um, but still, it, it's, it's given me great pleasure to be here this morning. Um, I have to add, collecting prizes is, I'm still trying to get used to that. And, and it's, um, I would much rather be here and talking science with you. Um, so the, the scientific question uh, our laboratory has, has been uh, working on for the last decade is actually a, a question and a problem um, many of you are very familiar with. That is um, apoptosis. Uh, that is how a cell, our, the component, the building components of our body, actually can activate a suicide program within themselves and disappear from this world. And the one well-known example to all of us, um, I, oops. This is a quite high tech. <laughs> oh. Oops. That's not what I mean. Yeah, I need a laser pointer. Laser pointer, yeah, this, this one. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, yeah, this one. Yeah. This one. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I need to flip back. Oops. <laughs> Here, back. Okay. okay. I'm sorry. This one. Okay. Backward, forward. All right. Pretty soon we need to Google this. <laughs> Find out where we are. Um, anyway, um, so we all know when the uh, frog, during frog development, before a uh, tadpole becomes a frog, its big tail disappears. Um, where does it go? The cells made up this big tail, activated apoptosis, and they just simply gone. Um, also, we probably don't aware, we don't remember too early during our development, in, in a few months into our development, all our fingers, toes are connected by the membranes. And these membranes disappear at a certain stage of development. And that's why we have beautiful fingers and toes. And these phenomena, um, the shaping of the body is, is uh, apoptosis the activation of this eight cell suicide program play a critical role. I think more importantly, uh, more relevant to the health of, of, of ourselves uh, is even during adult, apoptosis is going on every day. And billions of cells, especially in our immune system. And during the immune challenge, we, 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 our immune system uh, encounter a new, uh, let's say, bacterial infection, viral infection will generate many, many more, a lot more immune cells that particularly recognize that antigen. And after that get cleared, these cells are become useless. 
and they will have to undergo apoptosis. And the, the endothelial cells that line up our internal organs, epithelial cells line our, line, uh, cover our skin, also has to turn over, and they have to grow, and the new, newly generated cell has to be balanced by the activation of apoptotic program. So we, we will have this homostatic state. And if there are certain things going wrong, and the cells that are supposed to undergo apoptosis cannot do so, and we will have a problem. In the immune system, we have too much immune cell, we will have autoimmune disease. In other organs, too much cell without death, that could result in cancer. So our uh, goal and our ambition is to understand the cellular process, this cell undergo death, this process. We want to describe that process instead of descriptive observation into biochemical language. What are the biochemical reactions that control this process? And more importantly, we want to understand what's wrong in these biochemical reactions in disease, such as cancer. In addition, once we understand that defects, can we specially design chemical strategies, small molecules, that will be specifically correct these defects so we can achieve specialized therapy? So I think in, in this lecture, I will try to uh, basically walk you through what we have found uh, in the last decade of research in our laboratory about the biochemical programs of apoptosis using cultured human cell as a model. And in, in the later part of my lecture, I'm going to try to give you an example, although preliminary, give you a glimpse of how we can design chemicals that correct the specific defects in cancer cells and, and give us this maybe a chance that we can eliminate cancer cells based on its own property, biochemical property, the same exact mechanism they rely to become a cancer and to kill. I know now why they, they have Dr. Li Kaifu here. <laughs> Maybe I can flip it. Okay, now it's working. Okay. okay. <laughs> so that's how we break down the pro problem. You know, we have we have a, a, a cellular problem. We are trying to re reduce it to a biochemical problem. And this is a a, 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 a cell from our blood system and living at one moment. And that's when it starts to undergo apoptosis. How we know it's undergoing apoptosis, when the cell dies of apoptosis, they show this very characteristic markers. Basically, is this cell shrink, and in this process of apoptosis, from, they, from a melon, they become grapes. And they, the, from one large membrane wrapped, living cell, they become thousands, thousands of these small grips, small membrane-bound vesicles. They basically slip off the cell body. And these small vesicles are very rapidly engulfed or eaten, phagocytosed by the neighboring cells or the circulating macrophages. And that's why every day we have billions of cell dies inside our body. We never feel a thing. So what we want to understand is what are the signals that tell the cell when the cell knows that the life is no longer worth living and it's time to go. And how, when they know it's time to go, what kind of biochemical program they have to turn on? And in the end, what these programs leading to the degradation of the cell. So 
So in order to break down this process, we have to go from the morphological markers to biochemical markers. The biochemical markers we can analyze using biochemical tools, in this case, like electrophoresis. So during apoptosis, you know, one, the best, the first defined biochemical marker, um, defined by uh, Andrew Wiley in the early 80s, is the DNA, the genetic material that make up our body. The blueprint is a long, long polymers. And these long molecules, DNA, double helix, will get chopped down into pieces when the cell is, un is committed suicide, undergoing apoptosis, the so-called genetic death. And these pieces is not a random piece. It's, it's like uh, very defined with intervals. And I will explain to you why. That's why when you analyze, you, you analyze the size of these fragments and by electrophoresis, they will migrate on the agar shell based on its size. You will see like letters. The DNA before apoptosis is very large and long and they migrate on the top of the gel. And during apoptosis, they become smaller and smaller fragments. And also, this is the staining of a DNA, and this is a, a living cells, and we stain DNA with a special fluorescent dye. And you see that uh, the, the nuclei, which is where the DNA resides, is uniformly stained. Um, but during apoptosis, in this case, which is simply uh, induced cell to undergo by apoptosis by a small dose of UV light, and you see now that the, uh, the nu nuclear membrane collapse, the shape of the nuclear become changed, and they become this half moon shape. And you see the genetic material, the DNA, become very much more brightly stained. So this is these two, the fragment DNA into pieces, and this chromatin material inside the cell stained brightly are the two best known markers. So we can follow that. So following these, these two markers, and the, uh, a few years ago, we found out a biochemical pathway that what leads to the generation of these two markers. And here is a summarize of this pathway. And this pathway is a chain reaction. And here is the illustration of our genetic material, DNA. The DNA inside the nucleus is wrapped up in this nucleosomal structure around the histone octomers. So the DNA molecule is uh, connected by these, uh, uh, wrap around these histone uh, markers, uh, octomers, and these are the so-called linker region. And the inside of the nuclei, there are these hydrodimeric proteins. They are these two proteins together. They inside the nuclei, they are harmless. And we uh, identified these protein a few years ago, we give the name DFF for DNA fragmentation factor. And they are harmless until these group of protease that outside the nucleus become activated. These protease are the enzymes that cutting other protein substrate. So these are like scissors. But before the cells start to, to undergo apoptosis, these scissors all closed. So when the cell is decided to die, these scissors are open. And one of the substrate they will cleave is this, the 45 kilodalton uh, subunits of DFF, we call DFF45. So they cut these DFF45 at two sides. Once it gets cut, the fragments will dissociate from the 40 kilodalton protein. And this 40 kilodalton protein will subsequently fold into a protein complex, now this protein complex will have nuclease activity. Nuclease is another group of enzymes that cut DNA. And since this is inside the, the, the nuclei, and it starts cutting DNA, and specifically, it has affinity for other proteins, such as histone H1, that's normally localized at the nucleosomal linker region. So this nuclease, once activated, will have affinity for these protein like histone H1 
it's almost functioning like a guided missile. And it will go to its target and start to cleave the DNA at this linker region. And that's why the, when the DNA, you take DNA out from apoptotic cells, there are fragments with each interval of a DNA wrap up a histone octomer. And that's how you get all these exquisite DNA letter when you analyze it on ag agro cell. And also, since the, the DNA uh, usually is like long string, but with, uh, uh, um, but attached to the nuclear matrix, once it start cutting them, it's like you cut the, the a piece of plastics, uh, elastics, they will collapse to the, to the basic of the membrane. And that's why when you stay in the nuclei, and the certain region uh, in, the, in the nuclei become much more brightly stained because the DNA now all the collapse into a certain spot. So as you know, the, once the DNA gets fragmented into pieces, it's genetically the cell is dead. So that is become irreversible. So the point is, how this chain reaction started? I mentioned the chain reaction started with this intracellular protease called caspase. And these are like scissors. And in the living cell, these scissors are closed. And only when they become committed to death, the scissor is open. So our laboratory focused in the last 10 years about how the scissor is open from the closed stage. And biochemically, it's actually a very simple reaction and, and very easy to measure. That is, um, when the scissor is closed, this enzyme exists as a homodimer in a cytosolical fraction. And the homodimer meaning the two identical subunits of the protein together. And they have this two active side. Active side meaning that it is that position, at that position, it's usually a cysteine, and they use the cysteine to carry out the actual cleavage. These are the edge of the scissor. And the scissor is closed until they undergo this proteolysis activation themselves, meaning they need to be cut at these two positions in order to fold into the active configuration. And that cleavage, especially at this position, is the critical events to activate these caspases, activate these enzymes. So since the, the transition between the closed to open scissor is, can be measured by a cleavage of a protein, so we can use the change of its size to measure its activation. And that's, once we are able to measure a, what's happened in the, the, the process of happening, and then we can use this classical biochemical methods to figure out what is responsible for this event. Um, the, the strategy we use is to take a cell extract to break the cell now so we can reduce a cellular event into a test tube event. We can break the cell and make cell extracts. And we use the cell extract in the test tube, and we measure what happened to this particular caspase from inactive configuration and change it to active configuration, this biochemical reaction. And then we can fractionate the crude extracts into defined components by biochemical methods, chromatography uh, or other, and, and other uh, uh, different biochemical methods. In this way, we can isolate each individual components all the way to homogeneity and identify what protein are responsible for activating caspase, for opening the, the scissor. So this is our basic strategy. And this is what I just described. Um, the material we use actually is uh, from a large cultured human cancer, uh, in this particular case, HeLa cells, is from human uh, cervical carcinoma. And these cells can be cultured with, in large quantity. And we can make extract, we call it S100 extract, basically is we break the cell, 
Then we're using ultra centrifugation, using 100,000 G force to pallet everything insoluble and take the soluble components we call in supernatant S100. And when we subject this S100 to different uh, uh, chromatography uh, steps, these chromatography steps will separate different proteins according to its biochemical and the physical properties. And we know within this crude S100, if we put a radio-labeled cast base 3, for example, in there, and the incubate in a test tube, and we can get its activation by measuring its generation of smaller fragments from its precursor. That is unopened scissor, these are opened scissor. And we can, we can see that. And then we can separate all different fractions. And now we can put all these different fractions together and reconstitute this, this reaction. And in this way, we know that we need three fractions. And in addition to a nucleotide, and we can reconstitute this biochemical reaction. And then we can fix the two fractions and further fractionate the third fraction all the way to homogeneity. Then we can identify what it is. And we use the same strategy to identify each individual component. And this is one of the uh, uh, fractions that we purify to homo. First fraction we purify to homogeneity. Um, you see, this is a, a, a assay we use all the time. These fractions are the fractions from one of the uh, col columns, uh, chromatography columns. And we elute these columns with salt gradient um, from 0.1 molar to 0.3 molar sodium chloride. And the salt gradient will gradually uh, elute the protein of the column based on its strength that is bound to the column. The weaker bounders will elute with lower salt. The higher bounders will elute with higher salt. And then we collect all the fractions and we measure its activity. And in this case, we only measure one particular component and we supplement the other components in order to see the activity. And this one component uh, show clearly at this fraction two to four, we see a nice cast base activating activity. And then we run these fractions on the SDS page and stain with silver to see what proteins are still there. And we saw this nice protein correlate with this activity. This is the first protein we purify. And then we get the protein ID of this protein. And actually, this protein ID is very, very easy to do because this protein is colored. And with a colored protein, you can stick this protein into a, a, a spec photometer and read its absorbance profile. Actually, in a textbook, many of the colored protein are already known. And you look at textbook, you know uh, which protein has this absorbance profile. And this is actually turns out to be one of the most studied protein ever. But its function is totally different. And this protein turns out to be a cytochrome C. Cytochrome C, as we learned in a textbook a uh, long, long time ago, is a component of our electron transfer chain inside the mitochondria. And we know that the biological system use ATP as its energy source, like car using gasoline as its energy source. And the ATP is generated uh, from this food source, uh, mainly through the electron transfer chain on the inner membrane of mitochondria. Our mitochondria are another living organism inside our cells, which our cell engulfed a few billion years ago and sort of captured them and use them to, to generate energy. It's like our uh, power plant. Um, the, the reason why we use a different organism to generate energy for us, and this, the mitochondria still have its separate genomic material. They still have its own DNA, and the replication of its own DNA is independent of our own nuclear DNA. And this could be another very interesting topic to think about it, to talk about it. You know, our, inside our cell, we actually have two living organisms that are living together 
for over a billion years. And the main function of mitochondria, uh, previous known ones, are this generation of electron, uh, generation of our biological energy through electron transfer chain. Um, so the basic idea is uh, the electron will feed in this electron transfer chain made up of few, uh, quite a few proteins. And all of them except cytochrome C are the membrane proteins that stick to the inner membrane of mitochondria. And when the electron goes through this electron transfer chain to reduce oxygen to water, and along the way, it generated this proton gradient across the inner membrane. And it's this proton gradient that eventually used uh, with this uh, oxidative uh, phosphorylation and to, to generate ATP from ADP. And this is the major source of our energy. <clears throat> and the cytochrome C is, is the very well-known components and the only water-soluble components. And it's an essential component for life. Now, what our discovery also shows, the cytochrome C is actually a double agent. And it's in the, when it's in the mitochondria, it's activate, uh, it's, it's functioning as a part of the electron transfer chain. But when the cytochrome C actually come out of the mitochondria, and our finding indicates that it's, it has the ability to come out of the mitochondria. In the living cells, the cytochrome C is all in, enclosed by this out, out membrane of mitochondria. They are captured inside the mitochondria. But when the cell decided to die, the mitochondrial out membrane actually become permeable to the protein like cytochrome C. And once they come out the mitochondria, and they will initiate this chain of reaction. And the, the details of this chain reaction is has been worked out, uh, I'm going to show you in the next few slides. But the one in interesting anecdote is once we found the importance of cytochrome C for death as well, and we have to face a lot of skepticism. I think for two main reasons, and we didn't even believe ourselves when it's, when it's first discovered. Um, you know, one reason is the function of cytochrome C is such well known. And is one of the best studied protein ever. And everything you, you want to know about it, it seems to already know. And in fact, actually there is a, a pile up of list of top 10 most boring protein you can ever study. And the cytochrome C is the second on the list. You know, only after BSA. Uh, another reason is we say cytochrome C is important for, 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 de for death, for apoptosis. But we have to provide evidence. And the, function, the previous known function of cytochrome C didn't tell us anything about this new role for activating caspase. So in order to really show its new role, uh, although it's a very small protein, in apoptosis, we have to come out with three uh, evidence, three uh, layers of evidence. One is the biochemical evidence. We have to show how it, how it does it to activate caspase. And we have to provide structural evidence that structurally how it does it. And in the end, we have to provide genetic evidence that if you don't have this function in cytochrome C, is apoptosis really going to be defective? Uh, which is going to be extremely ch challenging because you cannot simply inactivate cytochrome C because it has also have the essential role for life as well. So biochemically, I'm, I'm going to uh, use this uh, uh, slide to illustrate now how much we know about how, uh, how cytochrome C activate caspase. And this is still an early version. Um, and now we have much more sophisticated version um, as well. So as I mentioned, Cytochrome C usually is inside the mitochondria. The mitochondria will receive apoptotic stimuli, such as a brief shining of UV light.
I hope high pitch sound would, wouldn't be apoptotic stimuli for your inner ear. <laughs> Actually, oh, <laughs> so what shall we do? <laughs> okay. So when the cytochrome C <coughs> come out of the mitochondria, <coughs> it will bind its partner protein, we call it APAF1, for apoptotic protease activating factor 1. And this protein, again, when it's in, when before it meets cytochrome C, it's inactive. It's folded in an inactive configuration. And when the cytochrome C bound, it will open up this configuration. And then it will in the presence of these nucleotides, and it will form this large protein complex, haptomer protein complex, we call it apoptosome. And this haptomer protein complex now will able to recruit the first caspase in this cascade to this apoptosome. And once these procaspase get act recruited to the apoptosome, it will become activated. And the scissor will become from closed to open. And that process is still, the, the molecular detail is still not understood yet. But once this procaspase 9, which is inactive, get on a apoptosome, it will become activate, and it will start to cleave caspase 3 and 7, the other caspases that constitute the majority of caspase activity in a dying cell to the active form. Now the scissor is fully opened, and the cell will doom to that. I just want to point one uh, interesting observation is these process require nucleotide, and particularly they like deoxynucleotide. And these two CDA, cladrobine and ferrozobin, are the clinical used nucleotide analogs for treat leukemia. And this particular analog are deoxynucleotide analog, and they can function just like DATP to trigger this reaction. And these drugs are the wonder drugs for a particular leukemia called hairy cell, hairy cell leukemia. It's one of the T cell leukemia. It's rare, but without, but these, it's rare, but with, with, without much cure before. Because these, usually the cancer therapy rely on the cell to grow fast. So in order to get poisoned by the current chemotherapeutic drug that usually poison the cell division apparatus. But these hairy cell leukemia grow very slow. And, but somehow, they are very sensitive to these nucleotide analog. And we know this nucleotide analog is very efficient in activating this apoptotic process. And turns out, in these hairy cell leukemia, they have very efficient way to convert the drug, which is like 2CDA, which is a prodrug, into this active form. Um, that, therefore, gives this specificity for this hairy cell leukemia. So this hairy cell leukemia now become cured. It's one of the few tum tumors that can be cured and without much side effects at all. So that gives us hopes and ideas that by understanding the details of this cell death pathway, first of all in general, then specialized to each individual cells, and then we probably can take this advantage and really start to design, to design molecules that can manipulate this particular process, just like 2CDA clozobin for hairy cell leukemia. <clears throat> so this is the, uh, uh, a structure, a Creo em structure of apoptosome. And it's, you, you look at it, it's a beautiful structure. And the cytochrome C is, is this little knot over here, 
And when I first see it, I always feel like this is shaped like a, like a space shape, a spaceship uh, with this, all these uh, flying saucers uh, like this. Um, and now we have this, uh, uh, this structure resolved in a much more details uh, up all the way down to, now to 12.5 angstrom. So we can see much more detailed decoration of this spaceship. Um, also, the genetic evidence. <clears throat> Here is, is a normal mouse. And now with t technology, we can take out a particular gene and any gene, almost any gene you want, from the genome of the mouse. And then we can look, uh, we, can, we can try to see what happens to that mouse. And therefore, referring to what's the function of that gene. And here is what happens if you take out caspase 3, which is the downstream caspase of this pathway. Caspase 9 and APAF1. And you see the, 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 the the head of the mouse now has this sort of mass grow out of it. And they all look similar. That means to confirm that these proteins do function in the same pathway. You take each individual one out, it's similar. And the most dramatic phenotype is actually in the central nervous system. And I don't know whether you know, more than half of the neurons that ever generated in our central nervous system actually have to undergo apoptosis before birth. And to give fine structures of the brain and the fine connections. And if, you, if the neurons cannot die, as they end up so much neurons in the brain, and they simply grow out of the skull. And this mouse was not able to live because they cannot pass the birth canal. The brain is too big. And here is a, a, a cytochrome C knocking mouse and generated in TechMax lab. And the knocking mouse, meaning that this is the cytochrome C gene. We cannot knock out, simply take out cytochrome C gene because cytochrome C is essential for life as well. But we can change a particular amino acid. And we know this amino acid 72 on cytochrome C is very important for its bonding to APAF1, but not critical for its respiration. So we can change that amino acid from, from uh, lysine to adenine just by side direct mutagenesis, then replace the, the, the wild type genome, wild type gene in the genome with this gene with only one single point mutation. And now the mouse, you look at their brain, they are almost identical as you take out caspase 3, caspase 9, and APAF1. So this genetically proved that a cytochrome C indeed is a double agent. And that we can actually separate these two functions of respiration versus apoptosis. And if you don't have the function of apoptosis, you will have the same phenotype as you lost a gene or like APAF1, caspase 9, and caspase 3. And here, we also show that the, the cells from these mouse that have, still have a wild type copy, which is totally normal, and with homologous, with both copy of the gene changed from K to A. And we measured its oxygen assumption. This is just measuring its electron transfer activity. When its transfer, transfer activity is normal, they will take, they will assume oxygen, and we can measure it. And the take up of the oxygen rate is absolutely identical. So these in this mutation will not affect the respiration. So, but it has dramatic effects on apoptosis. Here is some uh, uh, data. Uh, these mutations, this cytochrome C can still come out from mitochondria. Here is the, uh, is the staining of a cytochrome C in a cell. Here you see is a cell. And the cytochrome C is in the mitochondria. This, you can, like a dotted, uh, like little dots that spread out the cell. And now you know for each cell, although we only have one copy of the gene genome, um, and we have thousands of mitochondria with its own genome. And the cytochrome C will come out of the mitochondria. Now you see they stain 
like much more diffused when you give cell a little bit of UV light. But you look at the caspase activation in a cells that still have a wild type copy of cytochrome C, you have caspase activation. But in the homozygous, you don't have caspase activation. And you also don't form this large apoptosome structure when you give cell UV if both cytochrome C is changed. So that's genetically proved that cytochrome C is indeed a double agent. Here is their brain. And just to give you an example, how much more cell they have. And usually, you see in our brain, you have ventricles, right? You have this small, like, opening areas. Um, but in the cytochrome C knocking mouse, and you see the ventricles is completely filled with neurons. So they have just too much neuron. And they just, these neurons are supposed to die during development. They just couldn't die. So I will use this example, this, the, the importance of cytochrome C. And it's released from mitochondria as a critical controlling point. Also generate another interesting question. That is, how the cytochrome C come out of mitochondria is controlled. And that control turns out to be a very, very important uh, uh, point for study uh, to understand apoptosis. The control is actually done by these, lots of these, pro, these are all proteins, BAX, BCLXL, and, and the BFB3 only. All these proteins are previously identified as a member of the BCL2 family of proteins. BCL2 is a protein that first identified in follicular lymphoma, which is a B cell leukemia. And in this follicular lymphoma, they, over, they overproduced BCL2 protein because of a genetic defect. And once they overproduce that one single protein, that B cell, instead of after its function, will die. Uh, B cell is the cell that produces antibody. They usually, after producing antibody, they will die. But in this cell, they produced BCL2, and then sufficient for them to become a leukemia, and they, because these cells will not be able to die. The reason is this BCL2, BCL2 family proteins will protect the mitochondria, so the, the cytochrome C cannot release. And these proteins actually are decorated on the outside membrane of mitochondria. And in this family, they also have proteins like Bax that will promote the release of cytochrome C from mitochondria. So as you can see, for the death for a cell is probably the most important decision they ever made. So in order to make that decision and don't make it wrong, there are many, many layers of regu regular regulation before they actually finally committed to die. And one layer is this at the mitochondrial outer membrane. They have many, many, you know, at, I show this slide not means to confuse you. It's just to show you that there are many, many layers of regulatory steps that eventually leading to the decision making on the mitochondria. And this is one critical uh, layer. But even after cytochrome C is released from the mitochondria, and they can initiate this chain of reaction I just showed you previously to activate caspase, still doesn't mean the cell is doomed to die the cell actually has another layer of regulation. Even after cytochrome C release, the caspase is activated, and they will still fight hard to keep themselves alive. And, and this is done uh, by other pro these other group of proteins called IAPs. IAP, I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, in the next few slides. And this IAP will block caspase activation. So I show this slide basically tell you that I talk a lot about the mitochondria initiate caspase activation. What I didn't tell you is there is another caspase activation pathway from the cell surface, the so-called TNF-mediated caspase activation. 
And this caspase activation also through this a big protein complex, and they activate caspase 8 first. Caspase 8 is similar to caspase 9, which is activated by mitochondria. And these pathway also very important for activating apoptosis. But for a cancer cell, they need to shut down both pathways if they want to have the if they have ability to avoid death. And one part, one way is to overexpress like BCL2. As I mentioned, a simple overexpression of BCL2 in B cells will cause leukemia. And there are many other these these proteins that can protect mitochondria, also very well documented, overexpressed in, in, uh, in cancer as well. You will have a transgene overexpressed MCL1, another member of BCL2 family. You will have more than 80% of penetrance of get, get leukemia in mouse. <clears throat> so, Another f protein, family protein, is IAP. IAP has many members, such as CIAP, XIAP, and MOIAP. And these IAP molecules can block caspase activity. And these proteins are also often overexpressed in cancer cells. Like this pathway from the cell surface are exquisitely sensitive to the IAP inhibition. Because IAP, such as CIAP, can, can be recruited to this complex, caspase-activating complex, and to prevent caspase-8 activation. What is really intriguing is this molecule called TNF-alpha, TNF. TNF is so-called tumor necrosis factor, but itself is actually has double function, and it has growth-promoting activity as well because it can activate NF-kappa-B. NF-kappa-B can generate loss of survival uh, function. So this one single protein, TNF, can activate for the, in the majority of cases, and almost in all cancer cases, they activate TNF-alpha to give cells survival advantage. But in the meantime, it also have ability to activate caspase. But normally, this caspase activation activity is blocked by the IAPs. So the idea will be, if you can design a small molecule that take out this IAP function, will you be able to switch now the survival function to death? If cancer cells are actually using that survival function for their advantage in order to survive, if you can switch it, will you be preferentially kill them? So that is the question. So thank you. <clears throat> so now we get the good part. Um, so these are the uh, IAP molecules. So, uh, the, In order to survive, you have to have a very multiple layers of resistance, I guess. <laughs> um, so the IAP molecules have a, have a whole several members in our genome, and they are characterized by these. I use this uh, red bricks to representing a functional domain called the BRR domain. So these domains are the region that they use to bound active caspase. So they can actually associate with caspase, prevent its activation, and also distinguish its activity, extinguish its activity. But I also mentioned death is such important for life, for the whole well-being of the, of the animals. If the death cannot happen, then you have lots of problems. So for a cell, for every layer of Prevent, preventing cell deaths. There's also another counterbalance of a different protein that take out this layer. It's really a beautiful, complicated biological warfare going on inside our cell 
to determine what is live or die every day. So what is the counterpart? The counterpart is this protein called SMAP. We identified this protein in year 2000 and independently discovered by uh, David Vaux's group in Australia. <clears throat> and this is the critical structure of this SMAC protein. And you see here, it's, a, it's an arc-shaped uh, molecule. It's almost like a, a bow. Um, the tip of, this tip of this molecule in here is unstructured before it's bound its targets. And its target is this BIR domains on the IAP. I mentioned that this BIR domain are the functional domain of IAP. And they use this domain to, to bound caspase and inhibit caspase activity. And it's the same domain that bounds SMAC. But once SMAC bound to it, the caspase are un unable to bound. So they will be completely neutralized. So the SMAC protein are the, are the antagonist of IAPs. And here is a, is a, is a SMAC protein bound to the, the, here, the purple and this uh, orangish uh, are the BRR domains. And these are the IAP uh, SMAC bound to it. But what is really exciting and, and surprising was the bounding domain of the SMAC is actually only restricted to the four amino acids. And the four amino acids is at the end terminus of the SMAC, this alanine. And the SMAC protein is actually made in a genome, is a nuclear genome. And it's made in nuclear genome, it's translated, the protein is translated inside the cytosol. Then they need to be imported to the mitochondria. And to be imported there, they have to have a signal peptide. The signal peptide target smack to mitochondria will get cleaved off once it gets there. And the newly generated N terminus is this alanine. And you, from the structure study, you see this alanine is the only amino acid that can fit in this BIR domain. It's just like lock and key. And they can fit in there, and they are, can stay there. And since the functional domain is only four amino acids, this gives us a possibility that we can design chemicals, small molecules, that can function as a SMAC protein. And the SMAC protein, the native SMAC protein, as you can see, is a mitochondria protein. And it's like cytochrome C. It's come out of the mitochondria when the cell is undergoing apoptosis. But in cancer cells, the mitochondria is protected because they have often overexpressed BCL2 family of proteins. So the native protein would be able to come out of mitochondria. But if you design a small molecule that already, if you give to cells, can penetrate the cell membrane, so they don't have to go through mitochondria barrage. So they can directly go to the cytosol and carry out its function. So, and in the cytosolic part is where the IAP is. If the cell has lots of IAP, now it doesn't matter anymore. And you can always give more small molecules to counter, to take them out. So that's the ideal situation. But then the challenge is how you can design a chemical that is function as well as a protein, but can use, to, can put, give to cells and it can penetrate cell membrane and take out this function of a whole protein. That's the challenge. I also want to point out the native SMAC protein is a homodimer. So it's functioning as, as, a, as a dimer. <clears throat> so this is basically illustrate what I just said, that if we, have a di if we can design a molecule and what it will do to the, to, to it, the cell theoretically. So <clears throat> here is a small molecule that we actually uh, accidentally, an another chemical accident, um, so we are trying to find small molecule mimetics that mimic these four amino acids. You look here. This first is alanine, and valine, 
proline, and the C-terminal should be isoleucine. So we are trying to, because the peptide will be a, will be a bad drug candidate, because if you put the peptide into blood, it will be rapidly cleared out. So it will not be, it's not working. So you need to change these molecules, maintain its activity, but gradually make it look like chemicals, not like a peptide. So we first switched the C-terminal um, isoleucine and take out the peptide bond using this uh, other chemical motifs. It turns out any hydrophobic chemical motif seem to be okay at the C-terminal C force position. This proline is actually, you don't have to do much because proline is one of the best amino acids you know, for, uh, for drug design. This valine, it turns out, at P2 position, and we can extend many chemical uh, structures off this second position without the its activity. So that is good as well. Uh, in terms of alanine, we cannot do a whole lot, but we did one critical modification is to put a mes methyl group on it. That protected from the peptide digestion. That makes this much, much more stable, and that also turns out to be critical. But for over eight months, after hundreds of these synthesis, uh, we didn't come out with one single compound that is better than a peptide, two or, two or two fold better than a peptide, and which is very discouraging. Um, because the peptide was thousandfold less active than the native protein. And in one of these chemical accidents that we try to link more motifs at this P2 position, and accidentally, these two molecules dimerized at each other. And at that particular chemical reaction, there's only 0.2% of this yield of this dimer. But that particular batch of act give us higher than usual activity. I have to give credit to the people who actually did it, and they didn't let it go. They actually go back and found out what is unusual about this prep. And it turned out it's not the, the chemical product that we intended that give us, intended to get, give us activity. It's actually the, the byproduct of this point, this 2% this of byproduct give us the majority of activity. And once we figure this out, we can modify the chemical reaction. Now we can get over 90% yield of this dimer. And this dimer turns out in this, this titration of this caspase activation is almost as good as native protein. <clears throat> Which is actually not surprising, you know, because I've already mentioned to you the native protein is a dimer. So why don't we design a dimer in the first place? You know, why are we so, <clears throat> but we do have an excuse. That is, the native protein, the distance, the chemical distance between the two functional domain is too big. If you purposely want to design a dimer to mimic the native protein, the linker will be so long that you will not call itself a small molecule. And that by chance, by most likely, shouldn't be probably not going to get in the cell. But what we didn't know is the distance of this linker can be shortened. And the protein it bound is actually is much more is actually flexible. And these two uh, warheads can bound to the same protein, actually twist the protein and inactivate it. So the linker link, the linkage is don't have to be that long. So that's why this bounding is by pure accident, um, but glad we found it. So in a straight comparison, these are we get we call the temporarily called the compound 32. And by head-to-head -head comparison at 50 nanomolar, and this this one is even better than the native SMAC protein. And we can also do all sorts of modifications on a molecule now, so to make it more and more like a drug. And how it works in the cell. And this is one of the first 
experiments we did. So in theory, this compound will penetrate the cell, if it can, can take out the IEP and make the cell super sensitive to the cell surface receptors. And we use one of the cell surface receptor trail for co-treatment to see whether pre-treat our compound to cell will make the cell super sensitive to trail. Trail is one of the biological reagents. Uh, this ligand for the cell death receptor is currently uh, in phase two trials by several biotech companies, including Amgen. So the cell we use is actually glioblastoma. And, and we picked that because this, this tumor is the, most, is the worst tumor you can ever have. And usually after 18 prognosis is like 18 months. Not much you can do. And when we start to grow these cells, and I understand why. And I would say, if you ever, never work with cell culture before for the students, and this is the cell you should use to practice. Because if you forget to change medium for two weeks, they are perfectly fine. <laughs> and if you, let's say, accidentally forget to turn off your UV light in your tissue culture hood, and you irradiate the cell for 20 minutes, they are perfectly fine. And with HeLa cells, the radiation we give is five seconds, and you almost kill them completely. <coughs> so they are very resistant to this, and they are resistant to all the chemo drugs as well. And here is the cell alive. And we give them 50 nanogram per meal trail. They don't respond. And we give them one microgram, micromolar of our compound. They don't respond. That's when we put both together after two hours. And you are almost looking like a boiling water because you have so much massive apoptosis. Because when this cell undergo apoptosis, the cell from one melon becomes thousands of grapes. Imagine all the cells now become grapes, and they are just like boiling water. And we can go down with our compound from one micromolar to 0.1 micromolar, 50 nanomolar, 10 nanomolar, and one nanomolar. We still see massive apoptosis. And one nanomolar is already below. In, in this normal tissue culture condition with 10% serum, is already below most of the chemotherapeutic, almost all chemotherapeutic drugs currently used. And what is really intriguing is when we put the same stuff on a normal cell, this is a normal fibroblast from uh, human skin. And with our compound, even up to 10 micromolar with same amount of trail, and they don't even respond at all. They still grow, still growing, and it's perfectly fine. And we also tested normal uh, endothelium cells, let's say from breast. And again, the normal cells is, doesn't respond at all. <clears throat> and here is the uh, list of cells from different uh, tissue origin, all, all different, all from uh, all human uh, tumor line. And what we test is our compound, can it have synergy, let's say, with TNF and TRAIL? And we show, we found these cells have strong synergy. And we also tested whether they have synergy with now currently used chemotherapeutic drugs, atoposide, uh, paclitaxel, for cisplatin, for example. And for these, we show some modest synergy. And what is really exciting for me is these cells, although the percentage is not that great, 15 to 20%, are actually sensitive to the compound alone. And in the tumor biology field, there is always this idea that maybe the tumor cells, the apoptotic program is already on. Because they are un living under condition that normally will, tri will trigger normal cell to undergo apoptosis. Their genome is unstable. Genome unstability will trigger apoptosis in normal cells. And they live usually not in its right place when it's metastasized. It's leaving its matrix, not living in the right place, do not have the right growth condition, will trigger apoptosis in normal cells. 
but in these tumor cells, they're still alive, meaning that probably that although the apoptotic program is on, they have sufficient protection of anti-apoptotic proteins so to keep them alive. But if that theory is right, now we have a small molecule that can particularly specifically take out the anti-death block. Will that be sufficient to induce them to die? And in these small group of cells, that's clearly the IAP looks like is the one they use to block death. But for others, now we can go and look for um, wh whether there are other similar situations. And there are also cells that are totally resistant to this compound treatment. No matter what else we put co in combination. That is also a, a great question for us. Now we can go and study uh, what happened to these cells. So in the end, what I'm hoping is can we, before we do a treatment, can we take a small biopsy or a blood sample? We'll be able to predict and whether this particular patient will be responsive to this particular treatment. And that particular treatment is tailored for that particular cancer. And in theory, they shouldn't harm normal cells. And we also now put these compounds and into an uh, animal study. This is a, a xenograph model. This is a, a breast, human breast uh, cancer line. And we put in an uh, immunocompromised mouse. And we can give them therapy, um, like trio plus our compound. And we show with trio plus our compound, we can achieve, uh, we, can we can eliminate tumor in a quite high percentage of the, of the animals. So this compound also works in vivo. But of course, from a leading compound to a drug, you still have to go. There's still a long, long way to go. And you have to worry about off-target toxicity. You have to worry about uh, uh, the, the, the pharmacology, the PK, meaning that how long the drug will stay in the body and how, uh, and, and how long is your therapeutic window. And, but I think at least we have a principle and we know what to do. And we, can, we just need to make the compound to become a drug. So in the end, I would like to acknowledge the people who actually uh, contribute a great deal to what I told you today. Um, Xue Sung Liu is my uh, first graduate student who uh, purified cytochrome C with me. Um, Dr. Hua Zhou uh, cloned a path one protein. And Dr. Li Peng, who used to work in this place, actually worked with me uh, to figure out the role of Cas phase nine uh, in, the apop in this apoposome pathway together with Deepak Nijawan, a talented MSTP student. Uh, Dr. Trin Du discovered uh, a SMAC. Um, Chris Aiki uh, collaborated with us to solve the uh, crow em structure of apoposome. Yi Gong Xi at Princeton um, solved the crow structure of SMAC. And Patrick Heron led a group of talented uh, chemists to design accidentally the small molecule that we, um, Dr. Takmak uh, generated cytochrome C uh, knocking mouse. And I'll stop here and thank you very much for listening. Thank you for exciting lecture. Uh, first of all, I would like to apologize to Professor Xiaodong Wang and to the audience about the technical glitches during the lecture. So it seems uh, stories about life and death is uh, not always uh, not very straightforward. So I think uh, since we start out uh, a little bit late, so we uh, may have time only for a couple questions. So uh, please raise your hand if you have uh, any questions. We'll deliver the wireless mic to you. So any question? Oops. Yeah. Judging from your yes, yeah. okay. accidental uh, discovery 
of this dimer. Does it mean that the chances of getting better dimers is on the house? That we can actually do many other kind of protein because it seems to me dimers or whatever a more complex structure with a close pack is very useful. Yeah, that is a, a very good comment. Um, this particular dimer is, is excellent. Now we are now purposely um, design different dimers using different chemical couplings and, and hope to find better uh, property. Okay, so maybe the last question. Yes, uh, in the front, the second row. Congratulations for all this excellent work. And um, I, my question would be, would this compound be a sensitizer for agent that will enhance the cancer production? Because now, especially, a lot of your compounds may be more lipophilic, and the skin is really the major portion where the compound can localize. Would you be able to sensitize the radiation that induce uh, Cell death. That is a, a very good question, and and that's why we are studying. Um, is one of the major focus in the lab is to study its mode of action in a variety of cancer cells. And initially, what we we are thinking this may be best as a sensitizer, because in theory it will sensitize. Trail TNF uh, pathway extremely well, um, but we also now discover there are certain percentage of cells is sensitive to compound alone. And, and first of all, uh, this compound we are using we we are use, currently use IV IV uh, infusion <coughs> as as a road of delivery. What is unique about this compound, I think, is you mentioned the sensitizer. It's really remarkable is we measured how long we need to sensitize the cell in order for them to, to be sensitive to trail, for example. 15 minutes. How long it will last? You know, 15 minutes exposure to the compound will sensitize the cell. How long it will last? It will last for 24 hours. So in this regard, we really don't need the compound to stay very long. And uh, then we can, but in combination therapy, there is always the issue because the trail is still under clinical development. It's not a proven drug yet. Um, so our first route to clinic might be the, the, the tumors that is sensitive to compound alone. And we are working delic um, diligently to figure out the biomarker for the sensitivity. And I think we are very, very close. Okay. so. Thank you. So this concludes the Saw Prize Lecture in Life Science and Medicine. Uh, so one announcement, uh, the IAS roundtable will start in five minutes. Okay. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you very much.